This is Debbie Mack, and you're listening to The Crime Cafe. This week we're going to have another episode of Philip Marlowe, Private Eye, The King in Yellow. By the way, you can now find The Crime Cafe, Nine Book Set, and Anthology on Amazon as well as on my website, crimecafe.net. Click on Crime Cafe and you'll find the links there. So, enjoy the show. <laughs> Hollywood after midnight is like any other city after midnight. Night moves in and the city becomes hushed and stealthy. The nightclubs close up one by one, but now and then the police whistle and the prowl car siren serenade the sleeper. If you've got any cop in you at all, you get on edge and you have to get dressed and go out and walk it off to relax. Well, I was relaxing past the Swank Carlton Hotel on the Sunset Strip about 1 a.m. when all of a sudden, recess was over. Hey, Marlowe. Hmm? Is that you, Marlowe? It was George Millar, the quiet-spoken night clerk of the Carlton, hailing me from the doorway, probably to Mucha Melacrino. No, I was wrong. Hey, look, Marlowe. Uh, are you very busy right now? Why, Miller? if I may be as cagey as all that? We've got some well, some trouble on the eighth floor. Where's Curly, your fearless house dick? Tonight he has to have a hangover. What's the beef on floor eight? King Leopardi. Do you know him? King Leopardi? Oh, that's the sweetest trumpet this side of Gabriel. Is he tenting here tonight? Yeah, he's in the corridor on the eighth floor, dressed in yellow pajamas and his trumpet. <laughs> There's a girl with him, and they're putting on a jam session. Well, suppose the king rejects my diplomatic notes. Well, uh... Get rough, but only if you have to. Okay, thanks. But a guy with such an ear for music ought to listen to reason. All right, I'll be down five minutes more. I said, all right, King, the party's over. Hey! Were you addressing me, peasant? I said, wrap it up, can it? Put it on ice. The show is over. Ha! Conk him, King. King Conk, that's what he is, King Conk. Let him have it, King. Fanfare to a nosy house dick, as follows. <laughs> all right, now look, yellow pants. Wrap up your bugle and buzz off. Now hit the grit. Oh, you're tougher than a 40-cent steak, aren't you? Well, this will make you soft and tender. Here. Get him, boy, King. Get him again for me. All right, hit me with that trumpet, will you? Okay, King. Ooh. <gasps> right, now, come on. Get up, get dressed, and get out. How can he? He's out cold. I'll be glad to pack for him. And you get back to your room, too. Listen, copper, I don't have to do get anything. Get going, sister. Come on, jump. The door to room 815 was ajar. I went in and began tossing a lot of that yellow silk that the king liked so well into his suitcases. Something at the small desk stopped me. Tucked under the corner of the desk blotter was a note. It was assembled from words and letters cut out of newspapers and pasted on a telegraph blank. It said, 10 grand by Thursday night, Leopardi, or else. Her brother... I slipped the note in my pocket and went out in the corridor just as the king staggered past me into his room. I could get an infection from the dirty look he gave me as he slammed the door after him. <laughs> the door two suites away opened a crack and then shut again very quickly. I went over and knocked. Beat it, copper! I want to talk to you! I don't want to hear from you! Okay, here I come, sister, ready or not! I'll blow you down, so help me, I'll let you have it. Lay that pistol down, babe. Come on, Get out come on. you pick up weight you didn't count on. And what would the little girl be doing with a 25 automatic, I wonder? A girl needs protection with insects like <laughs> you around. Look, what's your name? Little Bo Peep. Okay, but what does little boy blue with a horn mean to you? I admire his work. Do you know King Leopardi? No. Well, what are you doing in a place like this? I can tell you can't afford it. What's your angle? I won a soap contest. 
All right, baby, you want it that way? What are you going to do? I'm going to make a phone call. It won't cost you a nickel. Hello, desk? Millar? Miss Marlowe? I'm calling for the lady in room 811. She's checking out. I had a little trouble up there, Millar. Your two noisy guests will be checking out any minute. Okay? Oh, well, I hate for things to happen on my shift. Well, the king bopped me with his bugle and the girl had a gun. Gee, nice people. Yeah, how come you put a floozy like that girl so close to the king? Well, I didn't. Another Couldn't thing. the day man did. Look, there was a receipt for rent to Miss Marilyn Delorme on the telephone table in her room. Well, that wasn't the name she gave Quillen. Apartment 211, Ridgeland Apartments, Cord Street, L.A. She lives right in town in a cheap neighborhood, but she checks in here at a price she can't afford and gives a phony name. Now, why? Why? Cord Street, where Marilyn Delorme lived, was Old Town. Arty Town, Crook Town. It was afternoon when I got off the cogwheel car that climbs the steep hill to where the Ridgeland apartment sat on the top of Bunker Hill. I went up dim, dusty stairs to apartment 211, and I tapped on the door. There was no answer, so I tried the door. It was unlocked. The room inside was dim with stagnant gloom. Marilyn Delorme was in. I didn't talk to her, though. I didn't think she'd want to make much conversation with those blue bruises about her throat, where she'd been strangled. I got out of there fast, wiping off doorknobs like Uriah Heap polishing apples for his boss. I found King Leopardi at his job at the Club Belvedere. He was relaxing at a table in the bar with a kind of a girl commonly referred to as a knockout. She looked tall, and her hair was the color of a brush fire seen through clouds of dust. I pulled in my chin and then walked over to the table. Hello, Leopardio Maestro. You remember me? I'm sorry, I can't say that. Why, you... Dirty keyhole snooper. King, please don't start anything again. You left a certain little note in your hotel room last night. Get out, night. time a dozen. That wasn't all. That dame with you I last said, night. I said, beat it. King, sit down. Beat it and take this with you. <clears throat> There's not much snap in that punch, King. Would you like to try it again? I, uh, have had some drinks. I'll see you later when I'm okay. See you later, too, Dolores, after the floor show. I'm, uh... I'm sorry, Miss... Uh, Sit Lisa. down. you made us conspicuous enough as it is. Now, wait a minute. Sit Look, down. Let's get... uh, all right, thanks. Well, that's what I get for being a little gentleman and letting him pepper me without a comeback. No, he's always spoiling for a fight. Uh, the king just can't control his dukes, can he? You better have a drink. All right. Coke with bitters. <laughs> that's what I love about Hollywood. You meet so many eccentrics. <laughs> yeah, but you see, I'm the kind of a guy who starts with a short beer and wakes up in Shanghai with a full beard. <laughs> <laughs> is this on me or is it on you? Well, that depends. Well, how champagne? Mum's cordon rouge, shall we say, hmm? It's on you. It's on me. <laughs> Coke with bitters. <laughs> how did you get to know King Leopardi? Oh, I just happened to throw him out of his hotel last night. Oh, house detective, huh? No, no, no. Filling in for a friend. Philip Marlowe, private investigator, is the general tag. Oh. How did you happen to get to know the king? I once sang in his band, but not for long. Uh, well, then, look, tell me, uh, would it be hard for a woman to get to him? Only if he was surrounded by a wall of fire. If the woman had a gun. Why? Well, I found this threat note on his desk last night. It asked for $10,000 or else, and it signed her brother. Well? Well? Yes. A woman with a gun could get to him, and everybody would give her a great big hand. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll skip that Coke and bitters and say good day and thank you, Christabel. The name is Dolores. Oh, good afternoon, Miss Drury. Kyoza. 
Dolores Chioza. Oh, Chioza. Fare thee well, Miss Chioza. <laughs> Formal, aren't you? <laughs> so long, Dolores. So long, Philip. If I hear of anything, I'll toss it your way. The evening papers carried a squib about Marilyn Delorme found strangled in her Cord Street apartment. That was all dead end. Until about one o'clock in the morning when the telephone started having hysterics on my night table. Yeah? Philip, this is Dolores. Dolores? Dolores? Oh, oh, yeah, sure. sure. Would you come over to my place right away? 2412 Renfrew Street, below Fountain. Hey, wait a minute. It's a sort of bungalow court. Mine is the last one in line. Well, sure, but wait a minute. What's the matter? Dolores, look, what's the matter? King Leopardi is here, too. King Leopardi? He passed out in my den. It's absurd, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's absurd. It'll cost you 20 bucks. All right, but hurry. Please hurry. All right, I'll be right over. Phone calls in the dead of night. I should have been a midwife. Oh, come in, Philip. I'm sorry I woke you at this hour. That's okay. I always get up around this time anyhow to take my bitters and answer phone calls. Where is he? Uh, may I have a cigarette? Sure. Thanks. Right. Where did you say he was now? In my den. Oh, Philip. Philip, he isn't drunk at all. Did you really think he was drunk? He's dead. What? The king is dead. Long live the... With my gun. Mm. With my gun. Well, good for you. The lady wins the large cupid doll. Hey, come on, let's go and look at him. <laughs> You are listening to The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin. Yes, families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste. New Pepsodent with invigorating irium foam. New fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new cool minty flavor. It's preferred three to one over any other toothpaste. It's true. Families all over America say new Pepsodent is their favorite three to one. The Paul A. Thompson family, Summer Street, Stanford, Connecticut, preferred new Pepsodent on every single count. The Thompsons say new Pepsodent tastes best of all, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. On all these counts, by an overwhelming average of three to one, families prefer new Pepsodent over any other toothpaste they tried. It's a fact. Families three to one say new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, and makes teeth brighter. Remember, this is not just our opinion. It's the honest conviction of the Thompsons and other families who compared new Pepsodent with the toothpaste they were using at home. Get new Pepsodent, the only toothpaste containing irium. Get it for your family without delay. We continue with the adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin, who appears by arrangement with Metro Golden Mare, producers of The Huckster, starring Clark Gable. Delora showed me to the den in the back of the house trumpet man, King Leopardi, was lying on the studio couch, large, smooth, and artificial looking even in death. A small Mauser automatic hung loosely in his right hand. There was a bullet hole in his golden yellow sport coat right over his heart. Dolores, is this your gun? Uh, Yes. Someone gave it to me once. I I don't even know how to use it. Oh, no. Oh, I don't expect you or anyone to believe me. Uh, Don't expect anything. Just tell it. Well, I... 
I, I was out late. I sing at KFQC on a late 15-minute program. Agatha and I got home about 11.30. Who's Agatha, the cat? My maid. Hmm. I came into the den for some liquor and fizz water and found him. Like that. I sent Agatha home so she wouldn't find him. Finally, I thought of calling you. Well, he got in here. How? I don't know. Were you ever in love with him? The king never loved anyone. I ask if you loved him. I hated everything about him. It's even better to tell the cops that is but copacetic. But I can't help it. It's the truth. Dolores, look. <laughs> Go on out in the other room and buy yourself a drink. I want to be alone here with tall, dead, and handsome. Go on now, huh? <laughs> After Dolores had taken her white face out of that room, I could work better. I went through the king's pocket and found his key ring. One key fit very nicely in the lock of the back door. I went to the living room where Dolores was huddled against the arm of the Davenport trying to become a part of the pattern. Dolores, how long has Agatha been with you? Two years. Hmm. Did you ever steal anything from you? Small things, that's all. There are nylons now and then. I, I didn't mind why. Well, she sold a key to somebody. A key to this apartment. Oh, what's the difference, Philip? We're wasting time. I'm done for as a nice person. They'll think it was a lover's quarrel and I shot him. Or that he shot himself over me. Well, you don't die from the latter, though. Your reputation does. And I care about what people think of me. Yeah. Well, that's what makes me for you again, lady. Thanks, Philip. Now, look, suppose you give me a description of Agatha and tell me where she lives. I want to talk to her. Tonight. I drove down Brighton Avenue looking for the house Dolores had described to me. All at once, I slammed on my brakes. In the driveway of a vacant house stood a small coupe. Dolores had described Agatha's car, and that was it. And Agatha did not live in an empty house. Well, I got out and walked up the gravel driveway and looked into the car. And then I got back in my own car and drove until I found an all-night drugstore. I phoned Detective Lieutenant Ibera. Hello, Ibera. Write this down. Brighton Avenue... 3200 block, west side, driveway of empty house, car parked with dead woman in it, when alive answered to the name of Agatha, strangled. I went back to the Carlton Hotel where it all started the night before. Quillen, the head day clerk, was on night duty. That surprised me a little bit. It was 2 a.m. and very empty, very quiet in the lobby. That was fine. Well, if it isn't Marlowe, the old clues man. A good, good morning. And tripe like that. Hello, Quillen. Look, how come you're on duty? Millar went on vacation this a.m. His brother has a cabinet crest line on the Arrowhead Road. Well, I didn't even know he had a brother. Now you know. Quillen, look, how come an old hotel man like you registers floozies like that Marilyn DeLorme on the same floor with people like King Leopardi? What? You heard me, mine host. I didn't register the girl or Leopardi. Millard did. What? You heard me. Well, why was the room between their rooms empty last night in times like these? Well, Millard had it marked on change. Plumbing out of whack or something. Why? Oh. Well, here's why. A lad with a pass key could have gone into that room and then unlocked the two connecting doors. And then you could have run a bus service between the girls' room and Leah Party's. What are you driving at? That girl in 811 had a gun and Leah Party had a threat letter last night. Now, here's what I want you to do. Call the hotel where Leah Party's staying now and ask if he's there. Why? Because. Good enough? Best reason in the world. Wife always uses it. Wait here. In about three minutes, Quillen came back and leaned on the counter again. Leopardi isn't there. I talked to a guy in his suite who was almost sober. He said Leopardi got a call about 11 from some girl. What girl? Well, he didn't know. But Leopardi went out preening himself. Mm. Okay, thanks, Phil. Anything to do with that brawl you had with Leopardi here last night? No, all in the spirit of boyish mayhem. Oh, that uh, 
That 815 has a jinx on it, you know. Girl shot herself there two years ago. What? The girl shot herself there. Yeah, yeah, you said that, but what girl? I don't know what her real name was. Look here, Quillen. I want to see your hotel files of that day two years ago and all the newspaper clippings about it. Come on. All right, all right. Let go of my arm, physical culture. I'll get the keys to the record room. I read the hotel files of that day two years ago, and I read the newspaper clippings of that suicide in 815. Then I asked Quillen just where George Millar's brother had his cabin in the mountains. It was just getting light when I pulled up at the cabin, high against a growth of dagger pine and cedar. Smoke was curling from the chimney. Someone was awake. George Millar himself opened the door. Well, Marlowe! Well, gee, it's good to see you. How'd you ever find us up here? How about some bacon and egg? The answer in my brief Marlowe morning manner is yes. Oh, well, that's well. Uh, I'll wake up my brother and we'll all eat together. Huh? You don't have to wake me up. I'm up. Oh, oh, hello, Gary. Who's your friend, George? Oh, Gaff, this is Philip Marlowe. You've heard me talk of him. How are you, Marlowe? Gaff Talley. That the name? Yeah, my brother. That's his fighting name. He used to be a heavyweight boxer. Fighter. Boxers dance. Fighters fight. Well, uh, let's get coffee started. Huh? Marlo's hungry. Yeah, say, I'm, I've had a busy night. King Leo Party's been bumped off. Uh, bumped off? Lowbrow killed. Vernacular for murder. The king is dead. Well, where? Uh, how did... In a girl's apartment. Nice girl, too. The old suicide gag. But it could ruin the girl. Oh, gee, that's lousy. I... Yeah. Yeah, but it won't work. It was murder. What makes you think it was murder? Well, Gaff, the way I case the job, the kill was supposed to have been pulled in his room, 815, at the Carlton Hotel, night before last. Uh, is that a fact now? Yeah. I spoil it by giving the king the merry heave-ho before the girl in 811 could get to him. Didn't I, George? Uh, I guess you did, Marlowe. Yeah. Of course, it would have been poetic justice if King Leopardi had been killed in the same room where a girl committed suicide two years ago. Registered as Mary Smith. Usual name, Eve Talley. Did you hear that, Gaff Talley? Eve Talley. I heard it, Marlo. So we had a sister named Eve. Shot herself in 815 at the Carlton. So what? So, George here told me that Quillen registered that professional gun girl in 815 night before last. Oh, no. George registered her. So? So George kept the room between the girl and Leopardi vacant. When everything was quiet, he'd open the communicating doors, and Marilyn Delorme would walk into the king's room, muffle her 25 in a pillow, and shoot the king in his sleep. How am I doing, boys? Fine, Marlon. How am I doing? Uh, Gaff, put away that gun. I bet you even checked on 118 Cord Street. Mm -hmm. I found Marilyn Delorme strangled. She knew too much. For a few bucks, you boys got Agatha to call Leah Party last night from the radio station and pretend she was Dolores with an interesting invitation. The king always had a yen for Dolores, and he came running. You shot the king before Dolores came home and left him in her den. Then Gaff got rid of Agatha. She knew too much, too. Leah Party was the worst kind of a rat, Marlowe. We loved our sister. She fell for him, and he threw her out. She killed herself. Now, what would you do, Marlowe? It... Take his gun, George. Don't get between us or behind him. His 45 goes right on through. Uh, I'll have to take your gun, Marlowe. Yeah. Well, always treat it like your own, won't you, George? Got it, George? I've got it. Stand out of the way. Does it have to be this way, Gaff? Yeah, it has to be this sure, way. Sure, George and Gaff, the avengers of innocent girlhood in their righteous indignation. Shut up, Marlowe. Lynch, mobs, tar and feather merchants, and other laws unto themselves take notice. George and Gaff, they wrote the book. Say your prayers, big Marlowe. Gaff, there's been enough killing. Get out of the No, way. Gaff, I won't. I swear I'll let you have it. No, to. Gaff! I'm warning you. I'll... Goodbye, Gaff. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to do it. George, he's dead. So I had to do it, Gav. I, I just had to. You understand, don't you, Marlowe? Yeah, yeah, I understand. He was a killer. He killed three people. He wasn't going to kill a fourth. 
I wanted to finish Leopardo out in the open and take what came, but Gaff tried to do it cute. I didn't know Leopardo was dead until you told me, Marlowe. I... I believe you, George. Yeah. Here's your gun back, Marlowe. It shoots fine. <laughs> I put in a big pitch for George at headquarters. After all, he hadn't killed anybody except Gaff, and that was in self-defense and in defense of an unofficial copper named Marlowe. He won't go get off scot-free, but he won't inhale cyanide either at the taxpayer's expense. After I talked to Ibera at headquarters, I telephoned Dolores Chiosa. I didn't give her the sordid details, but just told her not to worry that she was in the clear. Philip... Oh, thank you, Philip. I'm so relieved. I'm so grateful. I'm so thirsty. Well, come on over then. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, is this fiesta on you or is it on me? Why? Well, I mean, do I drink Coke and bitters or Cordon Rouge? It's on me. <laughs> All right, then. Champagne it is, baby. But look, let me bring the glasses, huh? <laughs> Concerning next week's show, here is our star, Van Heflin. Philip Marlowe crouched in the darkness of Beverly Glen and waited for those footsteps to come closer. And then all at once, the sandman hit him without bothering to remove the sand from the sandbag. And when Marlowe woke up in the morning, his wallet and his gun were gone. And he was wanted for murder. <laughs> Tonight's story was adapted by Milton Geiger from The King in Yellow by Raymond Chandler, creator of Philip Marlowe, the screen's most famous private detective. The original music was composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. This is Wendell Niles inviting you to listen again to another exciting mystery on the adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin with a distinguished cast. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.